We're here to talk, of course, about the children's book. Let me just sum it up for you. It's impossible, but I'll do it anyway, in three lines. Um, <laughs> okay, <I'll make> this. <laughs> it's a book about families set uh, at the end of the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, just before the First World War. And that's about the essence of it, I think. <laughs> and I will let you elaborate on it. One of the main characters is Olive Wellwood. She's a, a mother, and she's also the author of children's books. Books about children, ch books for children, and she's one of the main characters. That's correct, isn't it? Yes, the, the original idea of the book was an idea I had about the relationship of writers of children's books to their own children. And I looked at a lot of the great writers of children's books in that period in the 1890s, particularly sort of starting with E. Nesbitt and Kenneth Graham and James Barry and Rudyard Kipling, who was the one I loved most. Um, and also, I think he was, um, his, his life with his children became disastrous, but he was the best parent, I think, of the children's book writers. And then I came to see that the children of children's book writers were, all of them mostly, unhappy. Um, and didn't have a beautiful life with this wonderful person telling them wonderful stories. And because there was a sort of pattern of disaster among the children, I thought this would make a really interesting novel. Mm -hmm. Did you find out what is behind this pattern? Or I, is that what you set out to find? I set out to find, and I haven't quite found it. The belief I began with was that children's books are written by people who want to remain children. They want to continue to live in their own beautiful childhood. And I think this was particularly true of Kenneth Graham, who wrote The Wind in the Willows. I think he wanted to go on messing about in boats, as he says, as Ratty says to Merle. And I don't think he really knew what to do with his own son when he had him. And everybody said he wrote these wonderful stories for Mouse, his son. Mm -hmm. But actually, if you look at the biography, Mouse spent very little time with his parents. And he has some very dangerous habits, like going out into the road and lying down in front of motor cars. <laughs> so they said he could you have to remember there were almost no motor cars. <laughs> so he had to sort of stand there and wait for the motor car to run out and lie down in front of it. Um, so they sent him to the countryside. And in fact, a lot of these stories were sent by post. You know, they were not lovingly read at the bedside. Mm -hmm. And he ended very unhappily. They, his parents refused to notice that he couldn't see. Um, they sent him to very good schools because he couldn't see, he couldn't really read and write. Um, and he said he fought all the other boys and had to come home. And then they sent him to Oxford by pulling strings. And when he did his first exams there, he unusually at dinner drank a glass of port. And then he got up and went out to the railway line and lay down in front of a train. And his parents said it was an accident. Mm -hmm. That is, they didn't know what to do about the fact that he existed. And you find it's not the same pattern, but James Barry adopted these four boys and loved them too much. And he wanted them to go on being boys and not become men. And he wanted to be a boy with them. Mm -hmm. You know, they were all playing Treasure Island. Yeah. And they were playing wonderful games with swords in an orchard. And I don't know if anybody here has read Alison Utley. Yes, there's somebody over there waiting out. Mm -hmm. But most of the people haven't. <coughs> but she too wrote them on a sort of great children's books for my generation. And she had a son whom she loved, but she hated his wife. Um, and her husband and her son committed suicide. Although she wrote these wonderful sort of rural scenes mm -hmm. of meadows full of cowslips and lovely animals, which I loved when I was little. Uh -huh. And there was a story in The Guardian a week or two ago of a woman taking her to a festival of literature and asked her to say, what's all this going on, what's all this going on? And there was a big room full of children. She said, what are all these children doing here? And began to hit them with an umbrella. 
Um, so I think um, I came to the conclusion that children's book writers were rather odd people. <laughs> Very useful as a as a protagonist in a book then. Yes, but I did something something went wrong. Mm -hmm. I think most children's book writers do not have a lot of sexuality. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't make Olive, partly because I didn't see how she could have had as many children. <laughs> as she, she needed to have she needed to have. But partly because she just came out and, and E. Nesbitt, in fact, was a woman with a great deal of sexuality who had a wandering husband and had various affairs during her life. But Olive is not modelled on Ian Nesbitt. Is she modelled on anyone specifically? No, like most of their characters, she's a mix. I mean, a great chunk of her is modelled on D.H. Lawrence. Mm -hmm. She has G.H. Lawrence's childhood in many ways. Okay. Um, that she shies away from, she'd rather not think of. She ran. Yeah. So, so what she is doing in her writing is beautiful tales. <coughs> But she also writes rather sinister tales about underground, which are a transmutation of her terror of coal mines in which a lot of her family died. But and she recreates a sort of ideal world that she, with the children around her, at this manner, I can almost mm -hmm. say, to try it. It's, it's, it's a wonderful place for the children. They're extremely free and happy to roam around and and create their own little world and community. Not all of them enjoy this that much, but they have this space and she is happily right to away. happy to let them roam around. So there's a discrepancy between what's in her head and what she would like to be the ideal world and what she can actually manage. Is this typical for writers or f for women at that time? I think for both, and I think um, I think women writers were very lucky in one sense because most women who wanted to work, and I think the desire to work is as strong in a human being as the desire for sex mm -hmm. or anything else. Most women who wanted to work and be in a community that was making something, they simply couldn't. And some women, I think, were very happy in a house with children, and that was their work, and that's fine. But then there were others who were dissatisfied. And I think writers are more lucky than most in the sense that they can have it, they can have their cake and eat it. They can have the house and the children and the writing. But the writing takes something from the children, or anyway, the writer thinks it does.